Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov slash careers. Decorating Pages is a podcast dedicated to taking you behind the scenes of the designs of your favorite TV shows and films. Each episode, I'll be sharing design stories from some of Hollywood's most famous sets, interviews from set decorators, production designers, directors, and actors about creating the look of TV and film, about their design inspirations, and stories that take sets from page to screen. Welcome to Decorating Pages. I'm your host, Kim Wanup. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you are taking advantage of this time off and staying safe and healthy and catching up on some good TV and films. In this week, what Wanup's watching, I hit up Disney Plus and watched a few episodes of the series called Prop Culture. It has uh, this super fan that tracks down props from, obviously, Disney uh, stuff, but Mary Poppins, Pirates of the Caribbean, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Uh, there's a few others, but those are the only ones that I watched. Great scenes in the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids episode with prop master Brad Einhorn and his propping of the film. It also goes into showing the ISS prop house, which I thought was really neat for people to see. I, uh, I started Hollywood on Netflix, and I think it looks fantastic. I think the sets are really great, and it's probably uh, it's probably the best thing about the show. So I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to finish that. Maybe? I don't know. Uh, I watched the documentary called uh, Secret Love on Netflix also, which was such a tearjerker. Just a beautiful story about two women who had to hide their relationship they were together for like 70 years. I mean, the women's baseball. I mean, it, it goes into their love and their love letters that they wrote to each other. It's really beautiful. So, I don't know. If you feel like crying, maybe check that out. I'm still watching The Wire. Uh, we finished the second season of that. It's so good. It's so good. Like, so much happens in each episode. It's really good. I don't know. If you haven't watched The Wire, I don't know if you should be listening to this podcast. I gotta be honest. Uh, I'm obsessed with this book that I'm listening to on Audible, The Big Goodbye. Um, I had heard, uh, other people have recommended it, and it was already on my list of coming out because I've wanted to read a couple of things by this author, but this book is about the main players in bringing the film Chinatown to the screen, like uh, like Bob Evans, Roman Polanski, Jack Nicholson, and it goes into their history, and then their involvement with the film, and how they worked through it, and the effects of uh, the film Chinatown on the industry, and it's just wonderful insight into production designer Richard Silbert also. I did not really know the depth uh, and the pull that he had in Hollywood history. And the book goes into his design process of the film and others. And now I'm like obsessed with his work. So it's a really great book. I have an hour left. Um, I'm trying to savor it, but I'm sure I'll pop that off today. Um, and I'm going to start his next, his other book book that he has called Fifth Avenue, 5 a.m., Audrey Hepburn, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and The Dawn of the Modern Woman. And that author is Sam Wasson, if anybody's interested. So I can't wait for that. In this episode, production designer Adam Rao and I analyze the best production design brackets that hopefully you've been voting in for the last six weeks. I took the best production design Oscar winners and nominees since 1960 
and had sort of a March Madness type brackets, which everyone, I hope, voted in uh, for the best design of each decade. Adam was very kind to support me through this, and honestly, it was probably one of the few people I can say voted almost every day. This was fun. I don't know, I had fun. It also helped me by deciding which films to watch in my little A to Z experiment of watching old films that were nominated and won for Best Production Design. Uh, We break down every decade and have a lot of opinions on who won and who should have won and maybe some ties that shouldn't have been ties. You should have voted. It was great to reminisce about these films and that have inspired us and hopefully have inspired you. So the winners of each decade were The Great Gatsby, Avatar, Pleasantville, Blade Runner, Star Wars, and Cleopatra. The best of the best, Cleopatra, took it for the overall win. I'm kind of surprised, but not. I believe that film set a tremendous standard for our industry, and if you would like to see how these brackets played out, there will be a blog post coordinating with this episode, and all of the links for each decade will be there. I had a lot of fun talking this over with Adam. A uh, couple little technical problems. Zoom went out. Um, hopefully that's okay for you. I think someone is uh, tapping into my internet. I really got to be honest. Um, we dork out a little bit about Star Wars and Mandalorian. But anyway, really fun to talk over all of this with Adam. So I hope you enjoy. Well, it's like all of a sudden it goes by so fast. Like yeah. it's like, oh, first round, and then it's like, oh shit, I'm down to like final two. Yeah. I gotta yeah. I gotta get my boat in. But I do I listen, I here's how I uh, I'm on right now, by the way. Okay. Here's how I chose them, by the way, in case you were wondering. So I took the winners. So there's I'm definitely thir- wondering. There's 32 spots. So I took the winners. So there's 10. Then I took one that I thought possibly was runner-up and or should have won that year, in my own opinion. I love that. Then I took something like, let's say, a sci-fi one that year. I took like a period piece from that year. That was the third making up the third vote of that year. And then there was two random spots left over from the decade. And I literally just like went like up and down and then wherever my cursor stopped, those were the two that were odd. Okay. Now that makes sense. I, I was really excited about some, some of the pairings you had against each other. And cause there were, there were some that got knocked out right away because they were up against complicated yeah. competition. The other thing that I liked about the way this happened, like unlike a Emmy situation or an Oscar situation, there was no time to actually watch this stuff. So you're <laughs> voting on nostalgia yeah. and you're voting on what you think you remember, which is that to me is actually Feeling. the best scenery. Feeling. Because, yeah, you're, I yes. feel like I remember Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Like, I remember that. I feel like I remember Cleopatra. You know, like, yeah. it is feeling. And I, and I really enjoyed that part of the process of it because, first of all, it was, I'm sorry if there's a chime. That's, is that going to bother you? No, I mean, you could turn it off. That'd be cool. Yeah, let me <laughs> notification real quick. The feeling of voting on these things is what I like the most as opposed to actually researching them and like going back and like you had some movies that HUD, I think was one of them that I'd never even heard of. Like that was in the 60s category, I think. Right, I didn't even know what that was. So like when it came to things like that, I didn't vote because I thought it was unfair to like, HUD would have been awesome. I can see that. Because there were some categories where I'm like, oh, every, or like some rounds where like, oh, there's like a certain amount of votes, but then less in this one category. Like people weren't comfortable. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't think it was just you. I think it was like, oh no, I don't. I didn't see those two, or that's too hard. I can't, or I know those people. I don't want to vote. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it was funny sometimes where you could see like, oh, that one got that category got less votes. I wonder why. I also think there's something with this. Uh, unfortunately, this program that I use that if you don't. I think people also might have just hit their, you know, hit all their things and then push vote. Oh, and I see. it only picks up one 
Yeah, you gotta you gotta do it on every single bracket. Yeah, I, I mean, I think people figured it. I mean, I would hope I they hope. figured it out. Well, I hope. So, How, did you have to decide? You you might have explained this already, but explain to me again. So, you had to decide that Cleopatra went against Star Wars. Uh, so yes, I put in Cleopatra, and Star Wars was the seventies. So that's basically the first seed against like the fifth seed, and then so okay so. So then the second seed, or, you know what I mean? Like, it does it automatically in how you put it into the computer. So, like, it's March Madness rules, basically. Yeah, yeah. No, it was very cool. And what's exciting is that now from this, so Brian and I are currently watching, we watched all of Star Wars everything. We watched all of Harry Potter everything. Now we're going to watch all of the, um, the, what is it, Lord of the Rings everything. That's a long one, man. It is, but I, that's fine. I like, I'm enjoying the good versus evil of it all, but Cleopatra's shoved itself into after we do, we're done with oh, the, okay. um, oh. the Lord of the Rings. Cause she, I, when, she, I, I knew it mm. and I've seen it, but like, I don't really remember. Like, does she sleep with everybody? Like, oh. who, how does it happen? I don't well, I mean, the two scenes that stick out in my head is she gets unwrapped in that, they, they throw out a rug. Yeah, and, and here comes Liz Taylor. Like it's the most impressive entrance, ever, and she's perfect. <laughs> yeah. And then the other entrance is, of course, she's you know on her throne, and they bring her in on that big like golden horse, which is like fucking phenomenal too. Oh, so yeah. I, I know what you're saying, but you're frozen again. <laughs> oh balls! Why? Because I'm acting it out. <laughs> so as we're talking, Zoom goes out. My garage band goes out and as we get it all back and running and resume our conversation of the best production design of the last 10 years it didn't record the beginning but i'm going to loop you in mid conversation you're in there jump right in you can figure it out so it came down to great gatsby and inception it was a it was a face off of the leos really which i'm okay with <laughs> I'm okay with it anytime. Um, I love that. I, um, I mean, I, I think the razzle dazzle of Great Gatsby is so uh, like attractive and so rich in. There's so many sets in that that I loved. And Inception, I just think of like, I mean, I really liked Inception and the whole like slow motion and all of that. I think a lot of that car going over the bridge and I think a lot of the city like turning on its side. So more what I think about Inception is really special effects and maybe not the sets. Hmm. I would have to say that's a very good point. I would say that I feel the same way. Like I think about the moments in that movie and I know they made real models. They made models for that movie. Um, The little like temple, I guess that's in it It was a real model that they could blow up. And like, that, but again, that's like knowing more than just viewing it. If I really had to get down to brass tacks, knowing that they made Great Gatsby feel like it really did happen, whereas I, in my mind, Inception was always science fiction, like it was something that happens in someone's mind. Right. That's why I think I probably did go for Great Gatsby because it was like that party scene. Ugh. I just remember really enjoying and feeling like you're there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, and the camera work really lends to that, but that pool scene and his bedroom and Daisy's house with the flowers and yeah, the that cars. really was beautiful. Oh, I love that movie. I love it. I mean, I've, I own it in 3D. Like, I love that movie. <laughs> I love it. So I'm glad. I, I'm glad that. Gatsby took took it for the decade. I would say that I agree with that. I, I would say the only other like one that shocked me in that whole bracket too was that people liked Beauty and the Beast more than Lame Miz. Like that was I'm not saying yeah. that Lame Miz could have taken it by any stretch, so I'm not trying to say that. I'm happy that Great Gatsby won when I look at all these movies. But I Beauty and the Beast to me was just I liked it, but it was also, again, that nostalgia. You're just basically trying to capture something that we've already seen before. I agree. Where Les Miserables was actually making something that was on stage more fleshed out and so big. Oh, my God, it was huge, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that, again, goes with sort of that uh, child, like you're, they're, they're hooking on memories or something. I don't know. I mean, I don't know who's, who was a child for Beauty and the Beast, but 
I feel like that's maybe it. I don't know. Maybe they knew the songs better. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's true. And again, you're right. You're playing on feeling feelings of memories of sets, so, which is like, like, you know, you're impulsively voting sometimes. Um, all right. Well, that was the last 10 years. Then we moved to the 2000s. Um, I, is this your big, your big letdown in life? <laughs> right now it is. I mean, basically it's the biggest letdown of the quarantine so far. I mean, <laughs> Gangs of New York versus Amelie really put you over the edge. <laughs> it did. It really did. And But what I liked about it is that this that's the first time in the process of doing this that I was like, oh, this re- you really have to vote. If you really <laughs> like something, you know, you can't, you can't be pissed about it. <laughs> I mean, you didn't vote. yeah, but again, you go back to like some people like couldn't, I guess, couldn't vote, couldn't, couldn't make a decision between dream girls and King Kong because that had less votes than like the rest of them. Like that, that gets me of like, was it really that close for you? Dream girls versus King Kong. <laughs> like, but I don't know. That's the thing. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Or like, Oh, it was a, t- it was a close one between prestige and quills or, you know what I mean? That's, I think that's what's interesting too of like, Oh, well, avatar, avatar ran away with it. Like uh, almost every round. So I get that, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, memories of it, poor memories of a geisha in Chicago, Crouching Tiger, they didn't, uh, Good Shepherd. I know, they really got knocked out. And they were good. I know, those are good movies. They all got knocked out first round. This was hard. 2000s was hard, and I think 90s was really hard too, but 2000s was hard. I mean, there are some big movies going on in the 2000s, some big budget films that had like really glorious sets, I'd have to say. Yeah, I would say that honestly, though, when I look at the bracket, the only one that throws me off is the Amelie versus Gangs of New York. <laughs> and maybe I have to rewatch Gangs of New York, but I remember being like, God, this is so violent. That's the only thing I remember about that movie. But I love that Dream Girls beat King Kong. I love that um, Harry Potter beat Frida. Like, yeah. not that those aren't good movies, but like, he, Harry Potter, Sorcerer's Stone set the tone for oh. nine of the movies, you know? Oh, yeah. And I I really thought, because then we get later on, and Gangs of New York against Harry Potter. Yeah. I actually am shocked that it didn't have put up a bigger fight, that, that the Gangs of New York got more than double the votes for Yeah, and, and the same for Gangs of New York versus Dreamgirls. Everybody does the lights behind singers now because of Dream Girls. Right, like right. that. Well, I shouldn't say everybody does it. So I think Chicago did it first. But like that's, or well, maybe everybody did it. Who knows? But like we know that image from Dream Girls. I can't think of one iconic image from Gangs of New York. Can you? Uh, well, uh, uh, truth be told, I watched about 45 minutes of it a week or so ago. And here's the thing. I like the movie. It's long and it gets me a little like, it's a long road here. I've, I've seen it probably three times already. So I, I, I'm good. Um, the, I know that they built that whole city, that little five points. I know, um, like that whole this whole like underground sort of maze of of little cubby holes and everything. I mean, I think that's a good set and the and it's period and and all that jazz. But I I couldn't I couldn't rewatch it. But it's um I think it is a good movie. I I would have I'm one of the people that voted for Harry Potter though. I gotta be honest. I, I'm probably I'm pretty sure I always voted for Avatar, but like actually in retrospect. What are you voting on an avatar that you're voting on? You know what I mean? Like, well, uh, I was voting. Go ahead. Well, yeah. I mean, when it gets to Gangs of New York versus Avatar, I vote for Avatar because it was a like sort of a revolutionary type of design. Yeah, I feel like I I vote on Avatar because it was 3D and it was so beautiful to look at. You yeah. know, I mean, obviously that is production design, but like the actual rooms, when I think about the rooms, I think about the shipping container lab and I think about the spaceship. And then I think about that crazy tree. 
Yeah. You know, like, yeah. That, I guess, yeah, that is the reason why it won. It was so, I don't know, Lord of the Rings, that was a, that had to be, that was not a tough decision for people. It's four to two. Yeah, no. And then, I mean, I mean, but Avatar in the final round against Gangs of New York, 30 to two. Yeah. It was landslide over there. That was the biggest, that's the most amount of votes for this whole thing, I think, I, I got for this. But people really got on the Avatar train for this. And I think rightfully so. I think it dominated that decade. It was a new type of design. It was, as you said, 3D. And it was a gorgeous film. I don't yeah, know if the story was great, but it was a gorgeous film. Yeah, it really was beautiful. And I can remember exactly, you know, where I was when I saw it. And I remember loving it so much that I went back and saw it again. Like, those are the reasons why I voted the way that I did, because I remember being kind of enriched in that movie. And yeah, I don't actually remember the story that well. <laughs> I remember loving looking at it. Yeah, yeah. I think, and I know I saw it in 3D in the theaters, and I own it for some reason. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's. Let's I think it's sad for Chicago for just one second, though. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> we want to talk about Chicago. Chicago was. I mean, Chicago. I think. But Chicago against Lord of the Rings. That's a Without no brainer. A doubt. That's Lord a no of brainer. the Rings should have won. That is a true bracket. So I don't feel bad about that. But I think that Chicago is the birth of the newer modern musicals that have come out. Because if it wasn't for Chicago's success, I don't think we would have had Dreamgirls, or maybe I'm getting them backwards. But one of them was first, and then all of a sudden now we're. Well, Moulin Rouge, I believe, was first. Right? Oh, yeah. Okay. That could be true. You're right. I think Moulin Rouge, then Chicago, then Dreamgirls. Those three movies really are the reason why we have La La Land. And so, like, they're a, they're a really good, and they're beautiful. The, all three of those movies in their own right are great to watch. Yeah. And there are a lot of. I think Moulin Rouge is so much fun. It's depressing. Wow, I just I'm I'm surprised actually now looking back too that the Dark Knight uh, didn't get at least a single vote against Moulin Rouge because the Dark Knight too is another rebirth of the yes. Batman. I mean that was gorgeous. The way that bicycle. I mean there's so yeah. many great things. About I just that. I rewatched it for my little like A to Z uh, thing I'm doing, and the Dark Knight I was surprised at how much like the sets were great and gritty and the cinematography that goes along with all of it. Like they're really great sets. I, That's the one, is that the one where they're walking and the lights are coming on as they walk and it's a huge ceiling? Yes. Him and the, yes. That's yeah. the, yeah. I think, I think it's a disappointing, uh, back cave. I have to be honest. I don't think it's, I don't know. It's a big, wide open room with the white ceiling. I, I want to see, you know, and then they hit a button and shit comes up from the floor. I want to see, like, you know, his his tricks and his gadgets and his wardrobe. And I don't know. I was disappointed by that back cave. I feel, I'm feeling you on that. You're making a lot of great observations. <laughs> No, it's true. Like I got a lot right. of time during this pandemic that. to like criticize other people's work. Apparently, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's healthy to be critical because it makes us, you know, it makes us appreciate, and then it drives the bar of next excellence even further. You know, like as united front of viewers, you and I are those people. We are just as much viewers and critics as we are makers, and that's going to help us make better yeah. stuff. You know? I think absolutely. And I think, you know, oh, I saw that in that movie, and I kind of didn't like that, so I want to make sure I don't do that. And or, oh, I really like how they did that. And maybe I can emanate that in a different way uh, to, you know, and apply that to what I'm doing now. I think it's, I think it's all creative, and I think, you know, hopefully we all help each other like that. So, yeah. Yeah. But so well, that and so many people, so many people in production meetings speak in things they've seen. So yes. it helps to you. I mean, you're the queen of television. It's so great to be in a room with you when people are like, "Oh, remember that scene at Ozarks?" And you're like, "Oh yeah, got it." Got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One up, one up. Watched it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great talent I have. Thank you. <laughs> It, has, it, it is, is helpful. It's, it's super hey, valuable. It's hel it is valuable in this line of work, but uh, yes. So Avatar took that decade. So now the 90s, the 90s I feel like are so nostalgic and you start to look at back at these movies and you're like, man, there were so many good movies in the 90s. 
I mean, you got Forrest Gump, yeah, they, Romeo and Juliet, Babe, Pleasantville, L.A. Confidential, Titanic. I mean, there's some really good movies there. And there were some ties in this. Although, maybe not. Well, no, there was a lot of landslides, actually. <laughs> I'm actually surprised that um, that Pleasantville went as far as it did actually competing against Hook. Because Hook, for me, was kind of a rule breaker in fantasy world. Like, we had kids, we had adults, we had scary adults, we had very unusual worlds that were familiar to us at the same time. I agree. The texture in that movie was so beautiful. Um, I agree with that. I actually was surprised Pleasantville in the second round against Toys. Toys was so creative and so out there. Yeah, it was. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I appreciate Pleasantville, and I really love that movie, and I am surprised that it went that far. But I really thought, oh, it'll get knocked out by toys. So I thought it was going to be out, like, second round. And then I was surprised that Hook beat L.A. Confidential, and not because Hook is a better designed film, almost because L.A. Confidential is so popular. Oh, interesting. Okay, sure. Yeah, you're right. But I don't know. But I mean, I mean, LA Confidential against Dances with Wolves, that's, that was easy. I guess. I don't know. I guess it wasn't easy. I I, I really was happy that Dick Tracy made it as far as it did. Like, for me as a young audience member at the time, whatever year that came out, I knew before I even knew what design was, I knew that I was watching, well, something with Madonna. But I knew yes. that I was watching something that was outrageous. Like I, it was kind of like seeing Beetlejuice. Like it was like I don't know what I'm watching, but I love it. That's how, my memory of Dick Tracy. Also, Bram Stoker's Dracula was probably the first like scary movie that I saw, and I remember the doors on those that cat. I mean, just so many things about that castle were so beautiful. Right, let's just go back for a second. Bram Stoker's Dracula was the was the first scary movie you saw. It was that came out in like when we were in high school. <laughs> You I, mean, I, I can remember being like, is it okay if I go see this, mom? You know? I saw I, I, Clockwork I, Orange when I was six years old. Okay. No one was, no one was uh, parenting. There was no parental guidance on my TV. I'm I screwed for life. Back to that. Yes. Bram Stoker's Dracula, Interview with the Vampire, and Copycat were the first oh, like scary movies. I love I Copycat. Saw. I love that movie. I'm really that into serial killers. <laughs> That one was really good. With it's the really finger good. Under the bat. Oh my god! And yeah. she's agoraphobic. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I—I I mean, a no surprise to me that Shakespeare in Love didn't beat Bram Stoker's, and but then Bram Stoker's against Dick Tracy. Honestly, that's that's a no-brainer to me. Dick Tracy, I agree with you, is something that influenced me deeply. So yeah, yeah, it really did. And I, I, I look to work on the movie that comes out now that is the new Dick Tracy. Like in, in the dreams of where I could work, like doing something, I don't want to say I want to copy it. I just like that somebody had an idea and they're like, sure, let's go for it. You know? But don't you think that there's opportunities like that when they do all these Marvel films, but they've, they're stuck so much in making it like a half comedy that they've forgotten about the, the possibility of that visually maybe i mean i i would say that that is definitely true with costumes like i think costumes are so about the physique and about being serious like not upstaging the performer but like think about the costumes in dick tracy they were insane and like i don't know why we as a culture can't accept that right now like we just don't do that we're not risky that way and I, I'm not going to lie, I had the soundtrack on tape. <laughs> Someday You're Going to Be Mine or whatever it is that Madonna ballad. Oh, my God. I, yeah. I, I've sang it so many times. It's my shower song. I love Dick Tracy. I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to listen to that song. Dances with Wolves, I'm glad it didn't make it forward, but I do remember that movie being impactful. Like that, That's another movie that I can go back in my brain and be like, ooh, when I saw that, something happened to me. You know? Oh, I don't. I feel nothing for that movie. Unfortunately, I I did not vote. I don't believe on. Oh no, I voted on every single one. I think on these because I'm remembering what I voted for. So it came down to Titanic and Pleasantville. 
Now, and it was a tie. But here's where, because of the way I put it in, Pleasantville had a higher ranking. I would, okay, this is an interesting topic because okay. I would have to say that even though Titanic was insane and beautiful and big, Pleasantville took a bigger risk and designed itself in its own world, in my mind, better than Titanic. Yeah. I I mean, the scale is so out there for Titanic and, and what they achieved and that, yeah, I think artistically, there's a lot going on in Pleasantville there and the dressing and the period and, and making black and white work with color, even with costumes and set pieces. And I think it's a fantastic film. And um, yeah, I agree. I, I don't know. I think that's a tough one. Pleasantville do, versus Titanic. You're right. Is it's a, a tough one because what I go into my mind and I think about the achievement that they did in techno- technology and, and model making and how they created certain shots in the Titanic and, you know, yeah. rumor has it that made two boats and they cracked one of them and the other one is still sitting in storage somewhere. And I guarantee you, like on the 70th anniversary or 50th anniversary, oh we're going to get to go see the model. And Camille, who's the set designer that we've worked with, she has a picture of her sitting Indian style inside the the, um, the room with the staircase, the oh parlor, whatever God. you want to call it. She works as a model maker on that movie, on Titanic. Wow. God, yeah. that's like... That's awesome. Yeah, it's a really cool picture. She also worked, her gateway into the model making business was, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the title. The one with the triangle and the girl with blonde hair and Bruce Willis is the taxi driver. Oh, the fifth, fifth element. element. Yeah. She, she, so, so that was her, that actually, why wasn't that in this one? My God, the fifth element. Well, I, not everything can make it. I don't no, know if I that know. was nominated. I mean, I got to look that up, but if you look at the year... I don't know. See, I mean, I chose all these, uh, but, you know, some of them... I love what you did. That's not commentary on it. I'm just thinking, oh, my God, Fifth Element was so outrageous. It might have been that in that year, there was already a sci-fi nominated in that year, and maybe I didn't do... Maybe I didn't... Maybe I went for a period piece. That's... But I tried to do opposites. No, I love that. And I think that what we're seeing, too, and when we go into the decades, that things that were fantasy in this particular decade were so fantasy, right? They were right. way out there. Right. And things that were period were so believably period. I mean, I guess I could say Dance with Wolves was period, right? Yeah. Well, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I mean, I just look back at 90s and I watched, I rewatched uh, Romeo and Juliet the other night um, for my little experiment. And... My God, it's just fantastic. It's so well done to make Shakespeare interesting, even at the age I am. And I feel like I understand it more. And just visually how it complemented so much into them speaking Shakespearean. Like, I don't know. I was really into it. I was so appreciative of of rewatching Romeo and Juliet. It's really well in the end when she cries like oh, that that did. made her career that one scene like gave her the all of homeland i am <laughs> telling you right now dicaprio is amazing the, when he cries i am fortuneful when he's got that gun to his head it's he's amazing he's amazing i have been in love with him since this boy's life i i i, I love him Every How old in. was he when he did Romeo and Juliet? Was he like 15? 20, oh, I looked it up. He was 22. 22, okay. And, and she, she was, was really 17, young, right? she was like, 17, I think. Yeah. No, you're right. That movie was really fantastic. That was a game changer movie for me too. Yeah. I will never forget that cry. Like I can still, I haven't yeah. seen that movie probably since it came out and I can still remember that scene. It's so good. But yeah, and... Romeo and Juliet only made it second round. Lost a babe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was I, I. You want to talk about shocking? That to me was like, oh, really? We got some pig fans in here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That could have been me. No, I'm sure I would have voted for uh, Romeo and Juliet, but only one person voted, right? No, two to four. 
Okay. But, oh, then I, I would have voted. I don't think I voted for Babe. I don't think I voted I for Babe at all in any of them because honestly, I, it's a barn and I don't remember anything scenically about it. I remember the pig. That's well, Babe against Howard's End. I'm taking Babe. Yeah, that's true. So, I probably yeah. Didn't vote for babe then. Uh, all right, let's go to the 80s, which then we really get into some nostalgia shit here and some like really classics. Um, for me, I'd have to say, I, how can you not think that like Brazil isn't, I don't know. I thought Brazil, I thought, I thought Brazil, Brazil was going to win. Yeah. I totally thought Brazil was going to win, but Brazil had, uh, was up against, uh, 2010 and it was up against aliens and then who framed Roger rabbit and then made it to the finals against Blade Runner and then Blade Runner took it. So that journey, look who it had to beat, even just to get to there. 2010, now it's not 2001, but it's still a big space film. I mean, that's that's a big film. Aliens, another big space film. Right. And then poor Who Framed Roger Rabbit, <laughs> which, I mean, to me is like a total, like, dog-eared page and, like, that's what I want to do design I, I that film to me the design is just perfect. So yeah, I agree. There's so little that movie in general is like a very perfect film. Who yeah. framed Roger Rabbit? Yeah, um, and, and Blade Runner had to go against first round Return of the Jedi, then The Empire Strikes Back, then Tucker, Man and His Against His Man and His Dreams, and then The Abyss. So. I don't think it was any competition for Tucker, <laughs> but... Wow, that, that is such a tough... I'm so glad you broke it out that way. That is a really tough... Both of those tracks are really tough because each of those... I mean, Empire Strikes Back was yeah. so... Ugh. Well, I guess, again, that's playing on, you know, imagery that we've already seen before. So really it goes to the first one. You know, that's who gets the accolades. Right. Um, but still... Oh, a standalone oh, the abyss. I love the abyss, but no, oh, it didn't. I don't know. I Annie. I I was surprised it didn't. It won against Annie. Really? It won. It yeah. The abyss beat Annie in the first round. No, no, I knew that. that. I I'm surprised that you would say that. You would be. I'm. It's not a. It's obvious to me that the abyss would win because it was really on. I can't think of a better underwater movie. You know what I mean? Like that's that world of underwater and that. Well, I don't know how much production design was behind that shape underwater, but like that was. Well, that was, yeah, I get that, but it was a lot of like one. I don't know. They're in the submarine. They're down there. The one thing that's crazy about watching <laughs> Hard Knock Life, because I rewatched that not that long ago, just on YouTube, because I watch YouTube more than I watch TV. There's like 5 million edits in that. There's so many scenes inside a Hard Knock Life. Like they were building scenery till their hair fell out. I'm sure for that musical. Oh, uh, I'm sure. So sidebar, this chick I went to high school with is Molly. Oh, wow. She was two years older than me. Her sister was in my grade, but she, yeah, Molly went to my high school. How cool is that? That is cool, actually. Holy Spirit that's High School. Great. Yeah. Where uh, is she now? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a different episode, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's at least give a, I'm giving a clap to the color purple. I can't oh. believe it got beat out by the net. I cannot I believe that purple. either. Now, that yeah. again, though, that was a tie and went to the higher. So then I feel bad because, <laughs> but, oh, so no, I you love the color. You can't bad. That feels, that feels fair. I thought the color purple is a beautifully production design movie. I remember the natural being an adult, boring movie. That's my yes. feelings. About the yes, totally agree. I couldn't, I've watched it once. I'll never go back. I'm done. Color Purple, every time it's on, I watch it. And I'll tell you what, the same with Victor Victoria. Every time it's on and or maybe I'll just throw it on because I know every word to every song. I love Victor Victoria. 
Oh, cool. I love that. I actually, I can't say that I know the scenery in that movie. That <gasps> well. Oh, so good. But uh, I don't know. You got to be like a musical type fan. The right no, stuff am. is, yeah, but the right stuff is a great movie and was period for the, for the time, even though this was done in the eighties. And I believe that was like 62, 65 or something. But yeah. I can say I did not vote Ragtime or Coal Miner's Daughter because I had not seen either of those movies. So I did not vote for those. Um, well, I've seen both and Coal Miner's Daughter is depressing. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a good little movie, but it, pr- production design wise, it's no, it's, it can't compete really with a Ragtime, I feel, but that's just me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Up up higher uh, on that bracket, I think, too, I mean, Batman versus Dangerous Liaisons was a tie. And Dangerous Liaisons took it. Now, if Batman would have won, Batman against Last, Last Emperor, or I think Batman would have won, and then Batman would have gone against Gandhi, I think Batman would have made it pretty far, if not for that tie people. I think you're probably right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And Gandhi, I just rewatched. I had never seen it. Wow. That was a epic taking on of a film. I'm not saying there's like Brazil type sets, but there's a lot going on in that film. I'm impressed that you're, what's this A to Z thing you're talking about? Oh, so I'm choosing uh, from a to, starting with A, uh, like uh, A, a, a oh, fuck, I forget what I did for A. Um, but like I just watched The Irishman and then I did King's Speech and then I did Jojo Rabbit. And then um, so I'm doing nominated films that from A to Z. Oh, my gosh. Very cool. You could basically like. You could, that's a really, really cool thing. I'm assuming you're a new podcast about it. I just thought it was a good little project to have, another good little project to have during the pandemic. And just to revisit some of these like nominated or winning films. So it's been good. I mean, and I've seen so many films. It gives me an opportunity. Like I never saw Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte and it was really good. I mean, your visual vocabulary is going to be insane after you complete this. I mean, it's already good. I'm really impressed, Kim. Like, that is such a beautiful thing to do at this time, to fill up your head with excellent design. (laughs) That's really cool. Well, I mean, I'm also watching Housewives every other night, but I mean. (laughs) (laughs) You got to balance it out. Yeah. Uh, Well, thanks. I'm just, I don't know. I love movies. And I, I, if, uh, you know what? It's getting expensive. Because then I got to buy, you know what I mean? Like it's three ninety nine, three ninety nine. dollars But I mean, I have a lot of DVDs. <laughs> so, because like Batman Returns, I was like, oh, I own that? Or the Dark Knight. Dark Knight, I was like, oh, I own that? Okay, cool. Let me throw that on. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. that's another it side. Because we're doing it too. We're buying most of the things we're seeing. I mean, you're doing it too. You're doing these huge sequel, big trilogy type films. You're doing it too. Yeah, we're trying to do, like, the good versus bad. Like, that's where our avenue is right now. And we're lined up to see after that we're going to do Indiana Jones. So, like, we, we mm. basically got, like, the rest of, you know, the month of May figured out. We're we're okay. So you're doing – are you going to do the Chronicles? You're just going to do the films? We did, like, when we did Star Wars, we did, you know, the we did Solo. We did Rogue One. We did The Mandalorian. We did all the movies. Oh, wow. We did not watch the cartoon. Um, no. And then when we did Harry Potter, we did Fantastic Beasts. Oh, and then wow. all the Harry Potter movies. So when we do Lord of the Rings, we're going to do The Hobbits and then The Lord of the Rings. And then Indiana Jones, we'll do those four did, or five movies. Did you is. like Mandalorian? Yeah. One of the things that I, I thought it was really kind of boring in the middle. Like I felt like they could have like probably Very. cut out two episodes or whatever. Very. But one of the things that I really liked about it was that this is a kind of people that use their money to make better armor. And I can't say that I know of that many other stories that are told that way. I also thought it was really helpful for another Star Wars friend to tell me that it is not Yoda. 
that it is a baby creature that is the same species as Yoda because I kept trying to feed it into a timeline. Oh my God, me too. Me too. I was like, I had to, finally I had to look it up because I was like, this, I don't know when this is happening. And then I was like, oh wait, it's after Jedi, but before the last one. So it can't be Yoda. So it's not baby Yoda. So why is everybody calling it baby Yoda? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But what I liked about it is that kind of, I mean, not to bring it to go what's happening right now, but like, it is kind of like that. So you have this major story that is the Star Wars, you know, trilogy times two, whatever, sixtology, whatever that means. You have these giant overarching storylines but yet inside that story are all these little stories. And that's what was cool about Mandalorian. It was like, oh my gosh, it's the first series that I've seen take something that's much bigger and give us a smaller story inside the big story. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I really, I, I, I liked it overall, but I thought that there could have, it could have been four episodes. I actually think it would have been a really awesome two hour movie. Yeah. Like yeah. I didn't, I didn't exactly. need this. And like, why did you have a, what's her name? The comedian who played the mechanic. Like what, why? Because she's why awesome. Sedaris, Amy Sedaris. Cause she's awesome. Yeah, Amy Sedaris is awesome, but give her a part that she can really like. Uh, okay. Well, Nick Nolte was the voice and- of the dude and you didn't even know it was Nick Nolte. I had to look it up. The dude meaning the- Mandalorian. No, no. Well, I have a, no, that was like a Cuban guy or something, right? <laughs> Well, wait. So Nick Nolte was the guy who like helped him out. The guy who got freed. He was a slave. He was like a worker slave. The guy who like. Oh yeah. So yeah. that voice is Nick Nolte. The guy oh, wow. who's the Mandalorian. Who I'm not gonna spoil for anyone. You see him at eventually. Okay. Uh is the guy from Narcos who is basically. The new Burt Reynolds of our generation, and they made him look so oh ugly <laughs> in the scene that they show his face. I was so disappointed. I like that you call him the new Burt Reynolds. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, the, the lead up to who he was going to be was. I mean, in my mind, it should have been like I don't know who I thought it should have been George Clooney for that matter. But I was just kind of like because the build up about the face was such a big deal. Okay, but sorry, spoiler. Whoever it was. Could you have, like, made him come out of the mask a little bit more, like, not sweaty and bloated and bloody? (laughs) (laughs) Right? Like, he should come out of that mask, like, whew, I'm Brad Pitt. Yeah, well, and then to to have the girl who was awesome, by the way, I liked her. Yeah. But she had perfect hair the whole time. It's anyway. kind of like that scene in Jurassic Park, which surprised me that Jurassic Park never made it on this list, by the way. But in the new one where she's running through the mud and her heels stay on, it's like, what? Come on. I don't know if Jurassic Park was nominated, to be honest. Maybe I... I no, it's true. It probably wasn't. Uh, all right. Well, let's, let's, let's get back to our... Fo- let's focus here. Let's get back to the 70s. All yeah. right? Now... Okay. There's so... Uh, to me, there's such influential designed movies in the seventies that you see later on that I think a lot of these were hard. Well, the way we were against the Godfather, those are two sort of period films that went up against each other. Um, The sting versus Island on top of the world. So I was going to watch Island on top of the world and I didn't get an opportunity, but I had seen the sting. So I voted for the sting. I was saying that there were quite a f- not quite a few, but there were some I didn't vote on. Like I did not vote on the Sting and the Island on Top of the World because I didn't know either one of those. I don't think I voted on. Well, it's interesting because there are always three, so maybe I did vote. I know that I voted on Close Encounters with the Third Kind and Scrooge because Close Encounters should have won in my mind. Right. Uh, the Wiz, I definitely voted for every step of the way because I that was a very impactful movie for me. Like I, yes. I the world and all of that was great. I don't think I would have voted on Barry Lyndon, but I must have. Oh, Barry Lyndon was like really well done. Really like you should see Barry Lyndon. Um, I was glad to see that Star Wars moved ahead. Um, very much so, just because that first one was so important. Oh, definitely, it was. I, it was a. It created a whole new genre, I think. And we're still living in spaceships that look like that. Like we've never. Yeah. 
We've never gotten away from spaceships that look like Star Wars spaceships. I think the most breakthrough design choices of Star Wars to me is that it's in the future, but it's dirty. Yeah. And that that is sort of like, to me, in films that that precede this, or, or am I saying that right? Or per, before this, <laughs> proceed. Um they were all like sparkling clean. Like even if you look at 2001 in the sixties, it's pristine or I don't know, or, you know, buckaroo bonsai or whatever. Everything's like a brand new type ship running through that. You don't have a clunker. Yeah, no, you're right. And then, and it's so operat- operatic, like you get into some of the worlds and they're, they get so tall or so big or so vast or so wide. And then you shrink down to be inside a spaceship. Like I love it when movies, especially space movies, really play with that when you go from space to tiny and space to tiny. Cause you don't really, I mean, you can do that, especially if you do like castles and things, but like Harry Potter does that quite a bit too. But I, I just like that Star Wars really used that scale. And yeah. then all of the movies then did that too. I was surprised the sting went so far. The sting beat out Island of uh, top of the world. It beat out Patton, Mary queen of Scots, and then went up against Star Wars. But I, I guess, I don't know. I think it's because people know it. I really. think the side adventure would have went further to be quite honest, but I guess I guess not, but... Yeah, Poseidon Adventures definitely has imagery that people are familiar with. I would I would say that Heaven Can't Wait, I voted for that <laughs> one, only because I, I remember voting for it, because two reasons. One, it was like a major flop, and they spent a ton of money on yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and uh, my aunt was a background roller skater in that movie. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Giving a vote to your aunt. I get it. That's right. That's right. Uh, I like it. I was uh, I was glad to see that the whiz went so far, and I to me that meant that people were paying attention. I don't know why I think that, but I'm like, oh, people are in this really making like design decisions because, like I said, like Barry Lynn, you could vote for that, or you you could Adronomy Strain. There's a lot of design in that film also, and that's very graphic and it's very you know space and. Um, I was just glad that The Wiz made it as far as it did. I'm glad that you say that because, I mean, for me, The Wiz is, I mean, if you take the fact that they're redoing uh, The Wizard of Oz out of it, the fact that they set at The Wiz, like the scene with Oz, at the base of the World Trade Center, the real World Trade Center. I mean, they had to pull off an incredible feat to actually be in the in the courtyard of the World Trade Center for probably a couple of days. I mean, I don't or nights, I guess. Yeah, oh, I love that film, and I love the soundtrack, and another film, it was kind of scary to me. I feel like when I watched it, I was scared, but I probably oh, yeah. was like and eight this- years old. So. Yeah, no, I'm the same here, those crazy puppets I could oh, the- oh, my God, the- the- she was like a trash thing, like, it was like, oh, it was like scary or something, but having watched it uh, older, uh, it's, uh, I appreciate all, everything that they put into the design of that, and... I, I I'm surprised actually that all that jazz beat Chinatown. Me too. I'm really I surprised am. about that. Um, I I don't know. I'm not really a, f- a fan of all that jazz. I can I appreciate it, but I'm not a fan of it. I probably did vote for all that jazz, but now that you're saying that, I, I Chinatown really is incredible. You know, there's so much in that movie to make it look old. I'm reading that book about Chinatown. Have you ever, ever heard? Have you uh, have you ever heard of it? It's no. called The Big Goodbye by Sam Wasson. Okay. Oh, please, I'm audiobooking it. It's just the best. It goes all into like the big players that made Chinatown possible, like Polanski and Nicholson and um, Paramount, and how it didn't almost didn't get made, and how what a train wreck Faye Dunaway was, and like. <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, it's really good. Um, so, and and I never knew. I mean, I had heard of Richard Silbert, but I think from what I'm doing research on, he's basically the only production designer that I've heard of that then became a studio executive. Hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. And, and, and that's amazing to me that they would give credit to someone that has such uh, influential 
you know, impact on films and give them that well, voice and creativity and selecting films and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Well, I know, I'm curious to know if the part about the end, because I know that the, it didn't, they did not want it to end the way the movie ended. I oh, just they, remember hearing that. No, they, they didn't have an ending through most of the shooting. Mm. They didn't have an ending at all. And then, and then he wanted to shoot it this crazy way with that crane coming up at the end and no one was prepared for it. And even when they screamed the film, no one understood it. And they were like, Oh my God, it's a flop. And it only won. It was nominated, I think for like six Oscars, but it only won screenplay mm. because it was the year of, of Godfather two. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, now, we did have a matchup I thought was interesting in this was All That Jazz Against Cabaret. Yeah, that surprised me, too, because, well, I obviously voted for All That Jazz, and I can't understand why I would have done that, to be <laughs> honest. I would have thought that I would have voted for Cabaret, but at the same time... No, I think All That Jazz is a better... I yeah, think maybe that, I was right. I well, more that, innovation, I guess I would say. Cabaret is more classic scenery. Yeah, yeah. But it came down to the Wiz versus Star Wars, and Star Wars took it. And I don't, I think that that for that decorate, decade really represents a, a very good winner. Yeah, I do too. I think that bracket held up and did well. Um, the sixties. Now the sixties were interesting to select because I think um, up until sixty four or sixty five, they had different categories for black and white versus color. So oh. I actually had more winners. I think I had like fifteen more winners in here rather than like what I thought would be like runner up. So there are more winners in this bracket. Um, so that's where the black and white ones come in. Um, but there's some really like classics in it. To Kill a Mockingbird, 2001, Dr. Zhivago, Cleopatra, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Psycho. I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, some- I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with how the bracket laid out. I was, I do feel like Cleopatra is a better movie, no doubt, a better design movie. But Sound of Music not being able to move further bothered me only in the sense that I can't think of an earlier movie and I'm sure it existed where a city played a part like you understand that Austria is a character in the sound of music because of the way they use Austria right um and it, it's not a back lot you know when you look at My Fair Lady or you look at Hello Dolly or you look at these other musicals that are in this decade Mary Poppins those are sets the fact that Sound of Music was using the real place I think was really amazing yeah i love that they did that even psycho the how you know that was all scenery the, 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 i i don't know i'm assuming lawrence of arabia was all fake too i don't know oh i think there was location work on lawrence i i really can't believe that mary poppins beat lawrence of arabia but uh it was only one vote that that was a very weak <laughs> it was a re- really weak turnout for round two but Mary Poppins still beat out Lawrence of Arabia. So, and then went out to beat Mutiny and the Bounty and came up to the final two with Cleopatra. I mean, those two women really fought it out to the end. (laughs) (laughs) Two very different women. (laughs) I love that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's certainly should have beat out Oliver. I'm happy about that. And I'm glad to see that Breakfast at Tiffany's went on a little bit further. Yeah, I think um, once no, really, sorry, go once you come a, once you come up against a, a titan, like you know what I mean, like a big one. Yeah, because really, Breakfast at Tiffany's, you're playing on nostalgia. I mean, her apartment is cute, but it's nothing. I mean, that's not that big. I, and I do remember his apartment, like the guy who lived upstairs or downstairs. I'm pretty sure because wasn't she always going up and down the, the fire escape? Yeah, I actually don't like that movie. <laughs> I really don't. Um, and and I, the, the book that I'm reading, the Chinatown book, the next, the, he has a book written about Breakfast at Tiffany's and the making of, and I love Chupin and Capote. So I'm going to start that next, hoping that it'll make me like Bre- Breakfast at Tiffany's because I don't really like that book or movie. I don't really like it. And I started I'm, I'm reading not- it at a certain time and I couldn't even finish it. I was like, this girl is so dumb. Who? This is so dumb. 
Yeah, she is kind of ditzy. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I really liked his story, a male prostitute. I thought that was yeah. cool. Yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, Dr. Zhivago went pretty far also, but you go against like a period against a sci-fi when it came up against 2001. And, you know, I I get that. I I, I get voting for 2001 over Dr. Zhivago. I think what's important to point out, too, in this decade, and probably the previous one we talked about, that extras play such a humongous part in Cleopatra. I mean, they Mm. they use people as scenery in so many ways. They do that in Spartacus, and they do that in Mary Poppins, I'm sure. Um, And Gandhi. That's what I I mean. Gandhi had, I referenced that also. There's so many extras in Gandhi. It's insane. And, And Lawrence of Arabia. These yeah. epic films that had so many background, you're right. It's it's amazing. Yeah, we really don't do that that often. I feel like seven, nine. We're not seven, doing it now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Definitely not now. But 1917 had people in it, but it wasn't like masses of people at the end, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, these are epic, epic films and... Uh, yeah, you just don't make them like that anymore. You CGI them in. You fill like you know one section of the stadium, and then they duplicate it all. Is that what they did on um, on Veep when you guys yeah. were in the arena? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the sixties came down to Mary Poppins and Cleopatra, and Cleopatra took it. So back to back to our best of the best for a moment. Um, so yeah, I started the first seed as um from the sixties and then went down. So that's why the first round not everybody's in it and then Cleopatra and Great Gatsby or uh, Pleasantville show up because it, it skips somehow. I don't know. Um so yeah, Cleopatra versus Star Wars. I was surprised. <laughs> really? I'm not. Well, I think Star Wars is full of icons, but Cleopatra was so big and so, so outrageous. I mean, come on, that crazy black sphinx. They, they're they happy that fit through the archway. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody measured. Somebody measured. <laughs> Some art director was out there measuring. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an epic, epic undertaking of that film. So, yeah. And then also Blade Runner versus Pleasantville was a was a tie, and because Pleasantville was ranked higher, um, it did advance. Now, if it hadn't, I feel like it would have lost to Great Gatsby anyway. Yeah, I agree. So I still think Great Gatsby uh, to the finals is fine. And then Cleopatra. You, you could say though, if you compared Great Gatsby to Blade Runner, I think I would have voted on Blade Runner. Mm. I don't know. That's a tough one. I really do love Great Gatsby. I love the cars. I love I love so much about it. You're right. That flower scene is just so breathtaking. But Blade Runner, man, it was... Yeah. I've never seen columns that thick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess you're right. I don't know. I don't know. It's fun to think about. I know that's part of the part of the reason why I've enjoyed doing it so much is to think of, to critically think about these things. Because again, you start to come down to well, what do I like? I liked yeah. Great Gatsby better, but the design of Blade Runner was so innovative. Uh, maybe I'm excited to rewatch Ple- Pleasantville after all this because I have not seen that movie since it came out. So it'll be nice to rewatch it and like re understand why I knew that movie was important when I was 16 or however think, old I was when it came out. I think there's a lot of emotion in those colors. I think it's a really, I don't know, I think it's a good film, but now, I mean, semifinals Avatar versus Cleopatra, that also was a tie. Um, but I still, oh, I still think Cleopatra is not only a better, f- like, film, I think because of the time, it was, it's a more deserving winner over Avatar. I agree. But if I, if Great Gatsby would have won because of the, I would have been like, wait a minute, we got to go back. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was the, I think it was very good, but I'm very happy that Cleopatra won. Yes. And I think it's deserving. And I think that it set a bar. I think it, it from the 60s, it, yeah. it set a bar of this is, this is great design and this is epic, epic 
production design. Also, I think it's really one thing that works so well in that movie too is how big and how we've talked about people, but also the costumes really go mm. well with that whole thing. Like sometimes like Sweet Charity was in here and I feel like the costumes are great and the scenery is good and the choreography is good, but it's not harmonious. Like you, you don't watch that movie and you feel like you're watching one solid vision, even though it's fun to watch. Dick Tracy in some ways is that way too. You're watching a lot of really great ideas go into one place. Cleopatra, with the exception of some really weird period choice hair, <laughs> is amazing. <laughs> Listen, Liz had a contract. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you let Liz do Liz. Yeah, that's true. Um, but this was, I think, really do you think fun. It would have been bad? Do you think Cleopatra would have been as good if Marilyn Monroe played Cleopatra? <gasps> oh my God. Yes. I think it would have been, I, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think it would have been awesome. Yeah. Was she up for it? Did I miss it? Was no, that no, a- no. I just oh. was, cause I, I really do love Marilyn Monroe films. Like I, Me I know too. that that's very cliche and people kind of make fun of it, but we, Brian and I've seen maybe, I don't know, four or five of them and she's intoxicating. She oh. really does have something about her that you're just like in some like it hot. She's just, you love her. Some like it hot. In the seven year itch, she's eating those potatoes in the bathtub and you're like, man, <laughs> That's so normal. Why, do, why, why haven't I done that? Or like her reaction when he tries to kiss her and they're on the piano bench and they fall back. Yeah. Is perfect. It's absolutely perfect of this awkward, wait a minute. Like <laughs> it's so perfect. No, I love Marilyn Monroe movies. I love Bust Up. I love Niagara. I mean, I'm in. I have, I have not seen the, the big one, the one where, what's his name? Is yelling at her. Stella, isn't it? What is that one? No, that's Streetcar Named Desire. No, sorry. So, is, she's not in Streetcar. Or is she in Streetcar Named no, Desire? No, no, that's Vivian Lee. Oh, I have not seen Streetcar Named Desire. But then, no, there is some really... What What is Marilyn Rose like big drama? Well, Didn't she have one really big drama movie? Bus Stop? I mean, she was in Bus Stop. That was... Oh, yeah. oh, you mean the... The last one she was in with Clark Gable. And they're like cattle people. Anyway... I digress. I'm getting us off track, but right. we love Marilyn Row. Yes. Big, big, um, big Marilyn fans. Did you freeze? Did I? know? I'm here. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, there you go. Yeah, uh, I can hear you. Yes. Huge Marilyn fans. I used to have a whole uh, bedroom full of uh, artwork dedicated to her. So <laughs> that is now the nursery. <laughs> so, yeah. Um. Thank you, number one, for supporting me in this and being enthusiastic and uh, being a great guy. And I also want to thank you for being a genuinely amazing person and taking a job at Ralph's to help people shop. I mean, you are just the kindest, wholeheartedly amazing person. You're helping so many people. I'm so impressed by you. Well, thank you. Um yeah, we we I I think we're up to shopping to 142 people a day. We would like to do more, but we run out of freezer space and refrigerator space because so many people are buying so many frozen foods. So mm. basically, now I, I I used to have to shop until like 4:30 p.m. Like I started at six or seven. And now we're getting done at two, which is great. But um, no, thank you for saying that. I felt like I had to do something to help people who couldn't get out and do it. And uh, that's what I'm doing. I think that's... uh, But get me back into a TV soon, please. (laughs) TV start up now. July. I think July. My bet's on July. Wasn't that fun? (laughs) I think Adam and I had a little too much fun just dorking out over all of those movies, but I am so happy that he took interest in something that I thought was fun, and I hope you did too. And what a good guy. I mean, instead of, you know, sitting around like the rest of us, or me, uh, watching TV, he's out there helping people, and I hold on to that so much because there's so much bad news that uh, when you hear good news you think wow people are genuinely good inside and then to actually know a person who's that good inside it really puts faith uh, back in 
to all of us, I feel. So kudos to Adam. What a good job. So with all this extra time I have during the pandemic, I started to do little videos on YouTube from some of the past interviews of the podcast. Just little snippets, minute here, a couple minutes there. But if you want to check out visually some of the sets that people are talking about, check it out. It's the Decorating Pages YouTube channel on youtube.com. I also have the videos on the website decoratingpagespodcast.com. If you have any questions for me, please hit me up. If you have any suggestions of designers, decorators, prop masters, anyone you could think of, um, hit me up. I'll reach out to anyone. I got no shame. I hope you got an earful. I'm Kim Wanup for Decorating Pages. Decorating Pages is sponsored by Stogie Floaty, luxury pool floats. Float them if you got them. Available now at stogiefloaty.com.